This video will try and explain how the ancient Egyptians would not have sat around a table to come up with a simple workable solution to build the pyramids, but more a case of a system evolving to overcome the problems that faced them, which over time became a simple system that worked. The following story is a hypothetical one, which condenses decades of trial and error and the lessons learned over several pyramid projects into one single pyramid build. The ancient pyramid builders could have evolved this system to as far as we have shown or stopped at any point in between. Please enjoy the theory. Before the Aswan High Dam was built, the Nile would overflow and flood. This year, as every other, the inundation starts to flood the fields throughout Egypt. The farmers, unable to work their land for three months, have been enlisted to help build a huge monument for their god king to the power of the Egyptian nation. The royal quarries have been busy throughout the year, with quarrymen extracting the huge limestone blocks from the quarry face and standing them in a storage area near the Nile, ready for the pyramid building season to begin. The quarry docks are bustling with activity. The quarrymen are keen for the block transport manager, Bob, to clear some space in the storage area. And the managers, down at the pyramid building site, Jeff and Eddie, are keen to get started, utilising their huge influx of staff, and all they are waiting for are the building blocks. However, all is not well down at the quarry port. After a huge effort, the loading team managed to get the 10 ton block onto a wooden raft. They all pull together and drag it down the jitty into the mighty Nile. As the raft slowly leaves the jitty and enters into the water, it immediately turns over, with the block hanging upside down under the raft. Bob's heart sinks, and he watches as all his workers scurry around to drag the block back out of the water. A few hours pass while the loaders readjust the block, so that it is, yet again, on the raft. And once again, they try to float it. As soon as the raft moves away from the shore, the block turns over, yet again. Unsure of what action to take, Bob suggests adding even more material to the raft and trying again. A very unhappy quarry foreman comes down to the dock to remonstrate with the transport manager that the work at the quarry has had to stop, as the storage area is now full, and as far as he can see, hardly any blocks have so far been removed. The argument gets quite heated, and the quarry manager leaves telling Bob to clear the yard or else. Just as the quarry manager has left Bob's office, a messenger from the pyramid building site arrives with a letter from the site manager asking where on earth all his blocks are. He has hundreds of staff waiting and a tight schedule to keep. Meanwhile, down at the dockside, a crowd gathers to see if the latest effort will be able to stay upright. All is going well, as the huge block laden raft floats gently downstream, the whole team willing it on. But then, a royal barge passes the raft, and again the wake unsettles it, and once more, the block reverses to where it seems most comfortable, hiding under the raft. Sir, wouldn't it be easier to build boats like the pharaohs and send the blocks down the river in them? Seriously, rather than a raft, use a float that's not only extremely complicated to build, but also hugely expensive. Well, um, literally the type of boat our godlike pharaoh uses, just to move lumps of stone down the Nile. Well, they would need to have all the fancy bits on them, I suppose. Frank, do you know how many extremely skilled people with specialised equipment it would take to build a boat like that? How many tonnes of very expensive cedar wood you'd need, which would need to be floated in from Phoenicia hundreds of miles away, and then shaped into planks, seasoned, drilled with thousands of holes with a huge length of high quality rope to tie it all together, and then each of those technically brilliant boats would need a full and very experienced crew to man it. It's a blooming expensive way to move lumps of stone down the Nile, Frank. Fair point, sir. Anyway, it just occurred to me that it'd be us lot who'd have to find a way to load it every time. You're right. Rafts do require less material, and are far, far easier to build. But if only we could get them to stay upright. 
Bob is now under serious pressure. The rafts are taking much more precious material than first thought, the blocks are taking a lot of effort to load onto the rafts and have to be perfectly central before being roped up, and it is a very dangerous and difficult job trying to drag the rafts down the jetty onto the water. To add to his problems, the quarry manager has threatened him with unenviable violence if he doesn't get the storage yard cleared. On top of this, downstream the builders are sitting idly by, waiting for their blocks to arrive. Bob's underling, Billy, comes up to him and asks, What now, sir? Shall we drag the block back on shore and try again? Bob looks at the raft, with the block sitting happily underneath in the water. Stuff it! It's still floating. Just send it downstream like it is, and they will have to sort it out down there on the side. Bob starts to drag all the blocks down to the water, with the raft tightly attached on top. And finally, the storage yard starts to empty. One of the yard workers asked, Why are we dragging hundreds of blocks down to the water, when, with a little effort, we could dig a short canal and flood the block storage area? Bob liked this idea, so all the blocks in the storage area had the floats attached on top and as they flooded the storage area and the water rose, all the blocks gently lifted off the floor, ready to float freely down the canal to the Nile. With this new system in place, and with all the time allocated to building large rafts, loading the rafts and dragging the rafts down to the river, the quarry storage area soon started to empty. With the blocks tied under the rafts, a lot less material was required to float them. But Bob's problem now was that they were running out of the rare timber. And so loading was about to come to a grinding halt and Bob had no idea what to do. While at home, pondering his problems, Bob's wife tells him to go and bring the children in who were playing in the river. He walks to the riverside and smiles as he watches a bunch of kids diving off a raft they had all made by weaving papyrus stems together, and the younger children floating on top of their parents' air-filled leather water bags. As he watches the fun-filled idyllic scene, it suddenly struck him that he didn't need to use expensive hard wood to build the rafts, but instead he could save time and resources by using the ubiquitous materials already around him. The next day, he sent word to all the local households that there was a job for everyone, no matter what their strength or mobility, making papyrus rafts and inflating old animal skins. Everybody knew how to weave papyrus, as it was a free material which could be used in just about every situation. Shoes, tables, chairs, roofs and rafts were all made out of papyrus. Bob now had the problem of having too many staff, mainly made up of women, children, the old and disabled. Hello. But because there was now little heavy lifting and dragging involved, and raft making was no longer a specialised trade, he was able to allocate more men to the quarry team to speed up block production. <laughs> 